welcome to Shankar's daily news analysis. Today's topic of discussion is, first we will discuss about the Chalo India Drive. This is an initiative started by the Ministry of Tourism to boost the tourism in India. And secondly, we will discuss about the Buddhism. We will have a quick recap of the Buddhism from the UPSC prelims perspective. And lastly, we will discuss about the new scheme which is initiated by the Delhi government to reduce the vehicular emission by providing tax concession while purchasing a new vehicle. These are the topic of discussion for today's video. Before getting into today's video, I have an important announcement. Shankar IAS Academy is going to conduct a prelims test series known as pre stroming This test series consists of almost 48 tests and the batch third is going to start from November 21st. You can enroll in this test series by clicking the link given below in the description. Without further delay, let us get into today's discussion. So, this article is taken from Indian Express newspaper. Recently, one of the biggest travel and tourism exhibition happened in London. There, the government of India, specifically the Ministry of Tourism has launched an initiative and that initiative name is Chalo India Drive. Let us take a quick glimpse of it. One important data you have to note from this article is that it is given here. Almost 9.5 million foreign tourists has visited India in the, during the last year which is 2023 and UK is the third largest contributor of the foreign tourists to India and India has launched this initiative in the London recently. So, what is this Chalo India Drive? Chalo means let us go India. So, this initiative is launched by the Ministry of Tourism. You know tourism is an important sector in India and the main objective of this initiative is to boost the foreign tourist and how we are going to do is that with the help of the Indian diaspora who are living in the other countries. And the main target audience of this initiative is the OCI which is the Overseas Citizenship of India card holder and the NRIs. So, similarly with respect to modern India, we have a slogan called as Dilli Chalo. Leave it in the comment who said this slogan, Dilli Chalo. So, now we will see what are some key features of this uh, initiative which is the Chalo India initiative. The first feature is the free e-visa. So, under this initiative, the Overseas Citizenship of India card holder can nominate up to 5 members who are foreign nationals and they can get free e-visa and the you have to note that the government has cap the total number of visas up to the amount which is 1 lakh. Another important feature of this initiative is that government has launched a specific dedicated portal for this purpose. Under this, the OCI card holder can nominate their friends and after each nomination is verified, they will be given with a unique code and this will be used to access the free e-visa. So, I said about the exhibition which is the world travel market and there the Indian pavilion has decided to emphasize the MICE tourism initiative which is the meetings, incentives, conference and exhibitions. Under this pavilion, many cultural events such as the Mahakumbam, the wedding tourism is emphasized in this pavilion along with it a wedding setup is also showcased to to showcase the potential of India for the wedding tourism as well. So, this is the important thing you have to remember which is the MIC. They mainly focus on the cultural tourism and the wedding tourism. Now, we will see what are the implications of this Chalo India initiative one by one. So, you know during the COVID the tourism has tragic, the tourism industry has rapidly fell down by offering free visas under this initiative. India is hoping to encourage more international visits to India. Under this initiative we are aiming to recover the number of foreign tourists before uh, like the pre-pandemic levels. We are also aiming to boost the economic levels because by higher tourism we can increase the spending in other sectors such as hospital, transportation and other sectors actually and this initiative is aligning with the PM's initiative which is to make India as a global tourism destination by involving the OCI cardholders in promoting the Indian tourism we can achieve this goal. This initiative is also going to strengthen the engagement of diaspora to improve the economy of India because it is involving the Indian diaspora to promote the India as the travel destination. 
and finally by focusing on the MICE and the cultural events and wedding tourism this initiative which is the Chalo India is helping to diversify the interest of the India by attracting many markets and showcasing the rich heritage of India. So on the whole this initiative is helping to boost the tourism sector of India and to strengthen the ties between Indian diaspora and the government of India. It will also enhance the India as a global brand because we are going to make the India as a culturally rich destination by emphasizing the culture wedding tourism of India. So with this knowledge in mind, let us see a prelims practice question. Which of the following is not the focus area of Chalo India Drive? A. MICE Tourism B. Adventure Tourism C. Wedding Tourism D. Cultural Events like Mahakumbam The correct answer will be B. Adventure Tourism This is not the focus area of the Chalo India Drive. With this, let us conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next one. So, we have come to discussion of next article. You know, winter is coming up and you can see news articles where they are showing the prevalence of smog, especially in the NCR region. And one of the main reason for the prevalence of smog is the emission from the vehicle. So, to deal with this situation, the Delhi government has introduced a new scheme. And we are going to discuss about this scheme and what are the implications, the positive as well as negative implications of this scheme detailly. So, under this scheme, the owners will have a discount for the registration of new vehicle. How they will get this discount is that while scrapping the old vehicles, that is the old petrol and diesel vehicle, which have completed almost 15 years for the petrol vehicles and 10 years for the diesel vehicle, they will be given at the certificate called as the COD certificate and by showing this certificate, they can get a tax concession while purchasing the new vehicle. This is the overall view of the new scheme. Now, let us have a quick view of what this scheme is all about. First, this scheme was approved by the Lieutenant Governor of the NCR region and the main aim of this scheme is to replace the old vehicle which is main responsibility to release all the vehicular emission be it carbon monoxide, the sulphur dioxide, the particulate matter. By replacing the old vehicle, we can reach the more eco-friendly models such as the BS6 where we can blend the ethanol with the other uh, traditional fuels which will be more eco-friendly way. So, by replacing this uh, old vehicle with the new vehicle, we will be able to reduce the air pollution and thereby reduce the smog formation. This will improve the safety of the public because air pollution is one of the major concern with respect to the NCR region. What is the eligibility to get the tax concession with respect to this new scheme? This is a so, while scrapping the vehicle at the government facility, you will be given with a certificate called as the certificate of deposit and this certificate will be valid for almost 3 years and you have to also note that it is also electronically tradable which is providing a flexibility to the user. And another thing you have to note here is that it is excluded for the government owned vehicles and it is applicable only to the personal used vehicle and other vehicles. So, now let us see what is the tax concession which is provided to the non-transport vehicle and the transport vehicle. Non-transport vehicle is nothing but the vehicles which are we are using for the personal use. For with respect to the petrol vehicles in the personal use vehicles, it is given with almost 20 percentage tax concession and with respect to diesel vehicles in the personal use, we have 15 percentage tax concession. Similarly, Talking about the transport vehicles, we have almost 15 percentage of tax concession for the petrol, CNG and the LPG vehicles and with respect to diesel vehicles, we have 10 percentage tax concessions. These are the features that you have to understand about this new scheme. Now, let us see what are the advantages as well as disadvantages of this scheme. So, first advantage is the environmental benefits. By replacing the old vehicles, we are going to promote the usage of more cleaner, more efficient fuel. This will help in reducing the pollution that is happening in especially in the Delhi region. Also, by providing tax concession, we are by providing the tax concession, it is helping the consumer to easily access the cost of replacing the old vehicles and they are also having a detection by 
purchasing a new vehicle which will be helpful for the consumer also next advantages is that it is going to boost the vehicle market in india by by scrapping the old vehicle we can stimulate the demand for the more eco friendly models such as the electric vehicles and the vehicles which are using more cleaner fuel than compared to the traditional fuel this will benefit the manufacturers another important advantage is the reduction in the traffic by removing the old vehicle we can significantly improve the road safety and it will also reduce the congestion in the road which will be beneficial for the public next we also talked about the cod which is the certificate of deposit and this cod is electronically tradable and this uh, nature of the cod is helping the owners to have a flexibility to make use of the advantage these are the advantages of this scheme now let's see what are the disadvantages of this new scheme first is the short validity period only almost 3 years validity is given this can pressurize some owners to financially act quickly to purchase the new vehicle and the government has also capped the uh, tax concession for up to 50% of the scrap value which may not cover the total cost of the new vehicles we also saw a feature where the tax concession for the government vehicle is removed and this is partial in nature also another disadvantage is that it is having a potential to have a burden on the low income owners by replacing the old vehicle even with the tax concessions can be financially challenging to the low income people added to that it is a challenging scheme to implement because it requires a significant enforcement to ensure there is a proper scrapping of the old vehicles these are the disadvantages of this new scheme which is providing tax concessions for the scrapping of old vehicles and by purchasing the new vehicles now with this let's see a prelims practice question what is the tax concession percentage for registering a new non transport diesel vehicle option a 10% option b 15% option c 20% option d 25% and the correct answer is option b 15% with this let's conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one take a look at this article recently the first asian buddhist summit happened in new delhi this was organized by the ministry of culture along with the international buddhist confederation various scholars buddhist monks and the representative from all over asia took part in this summit and our president draupadi murmu has mentioned about the role of buddhism in countering the sectarianism which is nothing but a concept where the people are much attached to the religion and this can cause a division among themselves she also said the role of buddhism is not only a free of physical violence but also free of hate and greed which is a major cause for all the problems so why we have to learn about this is that Buddhism is a important topic with respect to UPSC prelims so let's take a quick look of the buddhism from the prelims perspective detail so buddhism it is a spiritual and a philosophical tradition which was started by the founder who is gautama buddha or the siddhartha gautama it actually originated in the ancient india between 5th to 6th century bce the main focus of this philosophy is that we have to focus on the understanding of the nature of suffering and what is the cause of this suffering and how to end this suffering this is given in the four noble truths of buddha we will also see what is the eightfold path and the various branches of buddhism in this discussion the core teachings of buddhism is given in this four noble truths first is the dukkha which is the suffering the life consists of the suffering and dissatisfaction and the reason for this dissatisfaction is the desires and attachment of a human being and this desire and attachment is called as the samudhya and this suffering can be ended by overcoming the attachment and craving which is given in the nirodha and lastly we have an eightfold path to end this suffering which is the magga we will see what is the eightfold path in the subsequent slide so dukkha is the suffering samudhya is the cause of suffering and nirodha is the end of suffering which is giving up the desires and magga is the eightfold path to give up this suffering this is the eightfold path which is given by the gautama buddha 
first is the right understanding, the right thought, the right speech, right action, right livelihood, right, right effort and the right mindfulness. For example, right mindfulness is nothing but we have to be aware and attentive of one's body, mind and feelings. And lastly, we have the right concentration. This is the eightfold path to attain the enlightenment. Now, we will see the core concept of Buddhism which is the karma and rebirth. Actually, karma is nothing but it is a law of cause and effect which is we are going to do an action that is we have an intention within ourselves, the word we speak, the deeds we do. This action will have an influence on the experience that we will have in the future. This is called as the karma. And another term with respect to Buddhism is the samsara which is the rebirth. The rebirth will continue again and again until you reach the end, enlightenment. And enlightenment is nothing but it is a point where one will reach the nirvana which is they will be liberated from the cycle of rebirth. This is the core concept of Buddhism which is karma. The law of cause and effect, the rebirth which is you will be liberated from the cycle of rebirth once you reach the enlightenment. So, now we will see what are some key branches of Buddhism. First, we have the Theravada Buddhism. This is also called as the doctrine of elders where it is prevalent mostly among the countries such as Sri Lanka, Thailand and Myanmar. The main focus of this Theravada Buddhism is that individual enlightenment can be achieved by doing meditation and by sticking to the teachings of the Buddhism. This is the Theravada Buddhism and another branch we have is the Mahayana Buddhism. This is prevalent in countries such as China, Japan, Korea and the main focus of this is the ideal of Bodhi Sattva. Under this branch, the enlightened person will choose to remind themselves in the cycle of rebirth because they have to help the other people to achieve the enlightenment. This is the Mahayana Buddhism and thirdly we have a Buddhism called as Vajrayana Buddhism and this type of Buddhism is mostly prevalent in countries such as Tibet and Mongolia. Here it consists of many complex rituals, the visualization and the meditation practices. It is also called as the Tibetan Buddhism. These are the three main branches of the Buddhism. So, the article started with the first Asian Buddhism summit. So, let us have a quick view of what this summit is all about. The first, we will talk about the purpose and objective of this summit. The first purpose is to promote the harmony. We are going to use the Buddhist principles such as the compassion and the non-violence to address the modern issues such as that is quoted in this article which is sectarianism, the social division and the climate change. And next, we have the cultural and the diplomatic exchange. Under this summit, we are going to strengthen the ties between major Buddhist countries such as Tibet. This will, by strengthening the ties between the Buddhist majority countries, we will be able to build a cultural bridge between these countries which is called as the Dhamma Setu, which is the cultural bridge. And the third and the third main objective of this summit is to preserve the heritage of Buddhism. We are going to focus on preserving the manuscripts, artifacts and languages. So recently, the classical language status was given to Pali and Prakrit in India. This will help us to protect the cultural treasures of the Buddhism. The key theme of this summit is to address the global challenges and to strengthen the community bonds. So, we know that India is the birthplace of Buddhism. So, we have a key role to support the teachings of Buddhism. So, India can also provide resources to preserve the literature and foreign literature and the teachings of Buddhism. We can also promote the Buddhism tourism in India. As already said, this summit happened in New Delhi and it was organized by the Ministry of Culture along with the International Buddhist Confederation. So, in this article discussion, we saw the basics about Buddhism and what is the first Asian Buddhist summit. We saw the purpose and what are the key themes of this summit. With this, let us see a prelims practice question with respect to this article discussion. The question is, who wrote the light of Asia? which presents the life and teachings of Buddha in a poetic form. The answer, the options are A. A. O. Hume, B. Balagangar Tilak, C. Sir Edwin Arnold and D. Dufferin. The answer is B. Balagangar Tilak. 
so with this we will conclude the discussion on this article we have come to end of today's video if you found the video informative do hit like give your feedbacks as comment and don't forget to subscribe thank you have a nice day